Cell 411 is a great free app for Android and iPhone. It allows you to set up public and private cells for dealing with crime, emergencies, setting up neighborhood watch, activism, and even protecting your kids from bullies on the street or at school. Cell 411 gives your cells turn-by-turn -turn directions to your location with one touch on your phone. There is also a Bluetooth panic button available that can be worn on your wrist, belt, or around your neck. Cell 411 has real-time chat for each alert so you can discuss the incident with family or friends in real-time video streaming. The video is stored on Cell 411's servers so your evidence cannot be deleted if your phone is taken or destroyed. Cell 411 has decentralized ride-sharing that allows for payment in any form – crypto, barter, silver, cash, etc. Cell 411 does not take a cut of your fare. Get Cell 411 free on Google Play and the iTunes Store or go to GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. And then one day, just out of the blue, him and a couple of the other guys used their company van and like drew, like screeched around the corner, grabbed this dude, threw him in an arm bar, and like jammed him in the van and like peeled off. We are just some modern day abolitionists looking to rid the world of the last vestige of slavery, statism. It's the Seeds of Liberty podcast with Andre, Dave, and Jeremy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 144th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a FIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. That includes Swaziland. You can find out more information about this at pipcot.org. So we are back. I am Jeremy. That's Dave. You heard Andre's here. What's up, guys? I sure am. Hey, what? What's hey. going on? Hey, and uh, <laughs> this week we are joined what? by uh, ret what returning. What is going on? Okay, returning guest and friend of the show, Shane Buell. What's up, Shane? Hello. What's up, guys? What's going on, Shane Buell? Just enjoying the presence of. Probably one of the coolest people on the planet, Shane Buell. You know, <laughs> there's also something supremely satisfying about saying your last name, Buell. I don't know. Yeah, you did pronounce it right. A lot of people butcher my last name, but you did pronounce it correctly. What? How do they say it? Buell. Uh, Buell. Be well. Uh, <laughs> be, yeah. be well. Be well. Shane. Be well. Well, like it's yeah, like I've heard very. What's prophecy. the what's the nation of origin of that? I <laughs> uh, believe it's um, Irish or German. Not really sure. It sounds, How do you not know where your name came from? Oh, wait a minute. It sounds, I, I like it sounds German. I would like to say I that. It sounds it Germanic. Yeah, it sounds Germanic. Yeah. I believe it is German. Oh. Either way, what's been what's been up in the uh, the shoot? I forgot where you live. It's up north, right? Up. <laughs> Cincinnati. I don't, I don't consider Cincinnati to be that far north. That's right. right. Cincinnati. Yeah, feet Damn, I did remember. Right. When you live in Bama, yes. everything's north. Right. Oh, it's but north I, of me. <laughs> I am about 800 feet above sea level, but I'm still, I don't know, considered to be in the southern part of the Midwest. There's still a lot of stuff north of me. Uh, well, 800 feet. Well, it's basically, if it's above Tennessee, I basically count it as doesn't exist to uh, me. Well, in I did recently visit I Tennessee. I don't believe it. I, uh, don't believe it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was no, uh, there how was for Tennessee? an orientation. Uh, it was great, actually. I went there for an orientation for a new job that uh, I started this week. And they sent me down to Tennessee for orientation, put me in a hotel, paid for everything, the room, the food. It was great. Ooh. It's about the only that, way I'm uh, traveling these days. I've done that before. That's real nice. You're like, how much is this uh, per diem? <laughs> yeah, so you can max it out every day. I never had that experience. I think the only time I ever had to travel for work for anything, I think I was working for like Stanley Steamer doing carpet cleaning. And I think we had to pay for half of the trip. We got some of it paid for and reimbursed for, but other parts we had to pay yeah, for. You know how like you can go fun. into the, you know, you can go to a gas station and get a, uh, get beer rang up as grocery instead of beer on the receipt. Right. Sure. <laughs> 
Um, that's what I used to do with all my per diems. Like I would eat bologna sandwiches while I was out. Uh, you know, if I had to go a couple states over and work for a week or two, and I would drive back uh, <laughs> a work van. Literally, you couldn't have fit another beer ca- case in there. <laughs> so. Oh, uh, see, I couldn't even get away with that on, on the trip that I took because the uh, not only did we have to pay for part of it, we went like we went to the the very scenic location of King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, which is right outside Philly, wow. and they have like the weird like in inside Pennsylvania, which normally doesn't have like horrible alcohol laws. King of Prussia has like the most antiquated laws ever, <laughs> <laughs> like the blue like, whatever the blue laws or whatever they are. They're so it was so ridiculous. Like we, getting beer was like nearly impossible. It was like the worst trip ever. Anyway. Yeah, I got a buddy who lives up in uh, like uh, an in, in an Inuit tribe. Uh, you guys may know him. His name's Haas, uh, and uh, alcohol is is straight up illegal in that tribal land. And uh, you can get like five hundred dollars a bottle for like Jack Daniels and like name brand stuff up there uh, if you smuggle it in. It's insane. Uh, right. What what laws cause you know little cobra effects? It's insane. I had I had no idea Haas lived up there. <laughs> oh, my I think gosh. I know who you're it's, talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know Haas, but that's that's. I mean, I've I've heard of that stuff before. That's that's an interesting money making opportunity, though. I may have to look into that. I mean, I would never, I of like, course, because yeah. that's you know illegal. You know, you wouldn't want to do something like that. That would be a big no no. Anyway, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, also like it's like it. You, he lives in an area where everyone literally knows everyone. Like you can't get away with anything. <laughs> Well, there's like 50 people in the village, I believe, or 100 people. Oh, kind of like the small town I grew up in, up in the mountains. You know, those are those are always fun. Yeah, sure. That explains your curmudge, your overall curmudgeonness. <laughs> no, I is, just you're a ma- you're a mountain man, but you're you're trying to live in New York right now, and you're just pissed off about it. You need to go find somewhere in a mount- mountainous area. See, I I would love to be able to blame. I would love to be able to blame my personality on that but unfortunately i'm pretty sure i was pretty curmudgeonly back in the mountains too i'm just well, yeah, I'm just an angry guy i mean man. you're I, supposed I, to just I, be I came an out, angry came, grumpy old mountain man i, I yeah, exactly I, I came out of the woods a grumpy old man i've i've told that story before when i when i first moved here before the entire neighborhood hated me um well that's not true. so either way either yeah. way it's, what's it's, been going on in shane buell's life we got superly sidetracked by where, how North. Uh, yeah, I love how Dave sidetracks me. This it sidetracks <laughs> everything. And as soon as I finally start answering a question, that's when he wants to go back to the actual show. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. We were way off. So I Shane, just realized how bad we were off. It's good. Uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, Dave actually had a, a plan for tonight, which is rare. And uh, he, he roped you into coming to talk to us. But the I, I think the overall he roped Jews. Yes, that's exactly Who's roping what he Jews did. around here. It, it's it's just not me. Anti semitism. I'm innocent. Anti semitism left and right. It's just crazy around here. Anyway, so <laughs> the, what was the topic, Dave? You wanted to do? Uh, Dave, vi- I just wanted to hear each and every vision, one of your vision. guys, and I wanted to give my my vision for what kind of policing we would like to see in a libertarian society, or you know. Uh, a market society that ha- had a the market in play uh, as far as policing goes. So I know I know Shane is pretty staunchly in the market agorist uh, band uh, camp. Uh, so I kind of wanted to hear his perspective on this. Well, Shane, because you're up. when you think, because when you think the market can solve every solution, right? Y- you're going to start from that premise. So I kind of wanted to hear that. Okay. Well, for example, uh, the free market is slightly functioning in this particular, I guess, category up in Detroit. You might be familiar with Dale Brown's Viper Threat Management, which is kind of like a private security firm firm that operates in parts of Detroit where the police have either been defunded or they just don't want to go. And uh, they've been having, yeah, or too scared to go. Yeah. But they have been having some success up there. Um, they've had actually reduced crime rates and things like that. The, the customers of this particular you know, police service are, are happier than they are with the monopolized police services that were provided previously. And I think that you know, in, in a sort of uh, 
panarchist, polycentric law type of system, there would be multiple options like Viper threat management for people to choose from. So they could subscribe from, you know, to one or another police service based on, you know, what's available in their particular area. And if they didn't like the service they were getting, then they could unsubscribe and uh, try a different service. Yeah. That's a pretty cohesive thought in my opinion. You guys want to break that down? Well, actually, I wanted to uh, I wanted to agree with what Shane was saying because uh, when I was when I lived in California, I actually worked for a private security company that functioned exactly like that. We had accounts with various different uh, uh, communities, gated communities, or apartment complexes, or you know what have you, uh, subdivisions, uh, housing associations, and we all uh, we we patrolled based on what our service area was. Now, of course, we used the public roads and all that and you know, there's really no other way to get around except on roads but uh the only place that we gave our services over to were the places that had contracted for our service and if they ceased their contract with us we no longer service them so when people say oh well you know <laughs> it's gotta be ge- it, well because well, there because there was always the argument made it's like oh well it's got to be geographic right you know the city's a city you know you have to organize it around the geography you really don't as far as the provision of security is concerned you really don't have to have it a geographic monopoly you don't especially especially not for like uh like residential security uh or business security you know like physical security for business locations you really don't it should be as on a per user basis um and there's no reason why that wouldn't work yeah i totally agree well, yeah, because like you said, you can you can see this being done now in certain certain places, and usually the only reason they don't do more is because they're hamstrung by the regulations that the state puts puts in place, and usually prevents them from taking you know f- further action where they're supposed to like defer to the police and stuff like that. Because yeah, p- private security firms, you know, a lot of people think of those. They think, oh, that's for like the you know the rich or stuff like that. Well, yeah, well, again, either that or they think they're rent a cops, right? Like the oh, he's like Paul Blart Mall cop. Well, exactly. Not really, I mean, I I used to do the same job that cops did. I was called out to domestic disturbances all the time in places. I mean, in Southern California, in like the seedier parts of Orange County. I know a lot of people listening to this who haven't been to California, but like, well, he's in Orange County, all rich. No, dude, trust me, it's not. There's plenty of really <laughs> shitty places in Orange County. But uh, yeah, I, I there's mean, gotta there's got to be uh, people to work the bars and the. <laughs> well, no, it's not just bars. I mean, we're talking about like well, you know, literally all the, the same janitor the jobs same and stuff like that. That's what I'm saying. Oh, um, well, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen. I see one clear point here is it just hit me like a brick, a ton of bricks, actually. Once you put it in that way of only imagine so if you had someone you subscribe, you subscribe to a, a, a protection racket, right? And then you're like, you know what? You're not doing what I want. You're useless. And I'm withdrawing payment. And they were like, no, nah, you're still paying. We're this is forced now. That's most people don't see the state as that, but that's exactly what it is. 100%. It's a forced racket. And when they don't allow market functions to happen, we don't actually get security to happen. So I think you're dead on, Shane. Well, it's not just me. Uh, Andre has some experience in that realm as well. Yeah, I actually tried to start a security business like that here in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and there just is not a market demand. And I didn't have the resources at the time or really the know-how at the time to kind of drive that market demand to build a market for what I was trying to provide. So, yeah. um, but uh, I mean, it's I, clearly there's models that that function and work and they're, they exist. So it's not like it's an impossible task or like, oh, well, nobody's ever done that before. And like, well, people have, you know, I used to work at one. So it's, it's certainly, po- it's certainly possible. It's not outside so, of the realm so of imagination. How do we get, so how do we get statutes and, you know, essentially laws enforced without, socializing the costs that's that's the big you have to, cre- you have to create the dem- you have to create the demand that our, andre was just mentioning doesn't exist in a lot of places currently because whether it's uh you know, you know whether people just haven't 
fathom these these ideas or maybe they aren't happy with the current policing that goes on in their neighborhood but they don't think there's anything they can do about it because they're getting you know they're getting their money robbed from them to pay for the crappy service in the first place you know just like so many other things the, the reason a lot of people don't donate as much to charity as maybe they would even though i mean i know they normally say that the u.s is still like the biggest when it comes to charity is still like the biggest in the world as far as you know what people give and stuff like that but people would probably give more if they didn't think, oh, well, you know, I, I'm already paying for this in one form anyway. People are already getting help. Well, yeah, of, of course, the argument's always, oh, well, who's going to pay for schools if the state doesn't do it? Like, well, exactly. Nobody well, wants to send their kids to school. <laughs> well, exactly. You know? It's all this. It's all that. Schools you know. haven't existed since the beginning of time. Don't believe any. <laughs> I mean, come on. Only states can produce roads, guys. OK, <laughs> once when the state came into existence, they said, let there be roads. And there were roads, and the state saw that there were roads, and they and it saw that it was good. Right from Dwight D. Eisenhower's lips, it just boom, it bam, right into existence. You know, you know the way, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my vision for for this is like all the property owners of an area come together and they say, "Hey, look, we want this insurance agency to form that's going to have a certain amount of." Uh, rules enforcement allowed that you've contractually binded yourself in agreement to in the the commons areas right on your own property there's certain different rules but in the commons areas specifically and in the interactions between you and other property owners you know so that's my ideal vision and I just hate that it is robbed from us because it is it's we're forced to be, pay for not only and uh, obey laws that no one wants or agrees with uh, when you really start oh, digging through not, the books. Again, the, again, the, that's, there's that's a, not true. There's, about there's, there's plenty of people of them that most people want. There, no, well, maybe there, not. There's, but there's, there's, it's no, not 500,000 like the state has right now. I, yeah, well... <laughs> Well, well, when it comes to that, most people, including the enforcement class themselves, don't know what all the laws and reg well, I don't think actually anybody knows what all the laws and regulations are. It's impossible. You can't. There's just too fucking many of them. The human mind cannot retain that much information at one one time. Even well, by the time you got halfway through the U.S. code, you would have forgotten the first uh, maybe I don't know eighth of it. So, <laughs> I mean, at this point, only an AI could look at the United States laws right break them all down remove all the ones that are duplicates or contradictory they're that confusing and so the problem yeah have, no 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 you're not even right there dave because some of the laws are only contradictory if they're interpreted a certain way so even that's an impossible task for an ai because yeah. the ai would be responsible with interpreting it a certain way which may not be the way and that it's going to be semantically driven it's, yeah yeah that's yeah. There's, there's no way to do that so so and unfortunately words are only defined by the people defining them so yeah. so the entire us the interstate laws commerce have clause have every word defined before this ai went and dig through it Yes, it would have to have a concrete definition, which of course it's never going to happen because it's part of the reason why some of these laws are ambiguous. I don't think I, I don't suspect they're all ambiguous just no. for a nefarious purpose. I think they some people just don't realize when they're writing them. Like I think uh, some of for them example, are necessary vague. and proper was only designed to have a very specific purpose, or uh, only the rights del or the the any power not delegated was supposed to have a very specific meaning, but, uh, you know, over time as people's minds change about things and this is, uh, you know, going back to the, the most basic thing, this is why you always define terms, right? But, uh, I think we're getting a little off topic. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did want to mention though, uh, cause we brought up because, uh, uh, we brought up the issue of, uh, insurance agencies, right? And mm -hmm. insurance underwriters. Um, I agree with Shane with regards to, you know, hiring your own security contractors and, in a free market, there's really no reason why there would only be one in an area unless they just happen to be so good that everybody likes them or they nobody else has bothered has to the create. desire to start another one mm -hmm. because they're, you know, moderately happy with their success. Like their their whatever displeasure or disagreement they have with the security service is not so great that they want to either start another one themselves or, you know, go out and find another service. But um a lot of what gets brought up, um, or at least to me anyway, this has been my experience, is, oh, well, what happens if uh, I don't agree to oh, go to your arbitrator and you don't agree to go to my arbitrator? 
because you know generally that's how dispute resolution is going to work absent a state because there's no you know there's no central there's no monopoly i've, on, I've uh, thought about this in depth and i have an answer for it oh. okay but go, go ahead, ahead no, no. oh well oh, okay oh, well oh. let me let me well let me finish my thought real quick so essentially uh where i was going with that is okay well say you don't agree and i don't agree and we both subscribe to different security companies i mean if we subscribe to the same security company they're not going to you know send security guards to kill other security guards for the same company because I disagree with you. So that's just a non-starter to begin with. Um, but let's assume that we have two different security companies that we contract with. Conflict, armed conflict, where you actually kill other people is easily the most expensive proposition that humanity can engage in. I, there, I, I cannot imagine and I cannot think of one that is more expensive than war. Would, Warfare is the single most expensive human endeavor that you can engage in, in terms of resources, opportunity. Yeah, costs, I just can't imagine human lives. Uh, insurance companies rationalizing war unless well, there was well, literally no other option. And that's what I'm getting to because these security companies are going to be underwritten by insurance companies, right? Mm -hmm, so correct. it's going to be in their interest. It's going to be in their financial interest. Um, to resolve this peacefully and to resolve this dispute in such a way that avoids the maximum amount of conflict because otherwise they're going to be out of pocket for something that ultimately is not going to solve anything like okay so say you know your security firm finally breaks down my door after killing you know a dozen of my security guards and half a dozen of their guys dying and then you come and kill me because I refuse to be subject to the other dude's arbitration well who what's been gained so literally nothing has been gained. There's only been loss. And sure, you could presumably, po well, possibly, presumably, um, confiscate or you know, confiscate my property after the fact. But is that really going to satisfy the amount of, you know, blood and money that you just spent <laughs> to confiscate like what a, a house? You yeah. know, a, a house with like some personal effects inside of it. No, the, it's the 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 calculation is so unbelievably skewed to disincentivize that behavior that it's almost not even bother is not really even worth thinking about. Yeah. It's only something so, so stupid a government would do, you know? Make yeah, that, I know. Make, make and it's country. like I told somebody the other day, the only, the only group of people that are able to engage in perpetual warfare is the state because they can socialize the cost of that conflict. Yep. Everybody else, we're out of pocket on our own why wars didn't used yeah. to be that big of a deal because you do, you have a feudal lord literally having to pay money out of his pocket to hire people to fight you have like, that shit's expensive yeah and if he didn't win he went bankrupt and his yeah. soldiers would come kill him for their yeah payment. and then his guys came knocking on his door exactly yeah so it was a losing proposition no matter how you so slice it. so all right so if go, you're ever going to yeah, be in con you. all right if you have a, a situation where we do have a libertarian or a, a free society, a free market society, or whatever. Um, you're if you're ever in contact with another human, they're either going to be in guest status, trespass status, or uh, resident status, right? And when they're in resident status, they're going to have to be part of some uh, insurance and protection agency, right? Just out of necessity. Uh, not a, oh. and, and well, these well, things I mean are. Generally they're speaking, they're not going to have to, but like I was going to say convenience because it's not going to be necessity. People could choose because I, I, when we were talking oh, before, there's going to be people that are like, "Nah, screw that. I get it." I'm uh, well, no, obviously, well, even outliers. even so, but as a property owner or as somebody who's in control of that property, where you have the title to the property, um, it's going to be in your best interest to have an insurance policy that covers your guests. Oh yeah, just uh, just in terms of liability. So well, like, generally speaking, anybody who's going to be on your property that you want there will likely be covered by some form of insurance. Okay, so the, the the insurance agencies would have a regulating industry above them as well for them to go to arbitration with each other. If they didn't, then it would be just essentially who can build up the biggest um, insurance agency to blow up the other ones. But so, it, but yeah, but there's really again, there's there's 
there's only a short term incentive for that because one, one, you know, one, once, once you do that and blow everybody up, then a lot of people don't want to give you money and you run out of money really quickly to be able to continue that type of behavior. <laughs> and then, so yeah, you can't, uh, you can't quash competition forever. It's just, it's, well, if you have all the guns, it really doesn't matter what anybody but, wants. But what we're, what we're talking about here with the, well, like the insurance, the insurance model that some people may just scoff at, it's like, well, no, that's on, on, on a very base level. That's the kind of the reason that, you know, Geico and State Farm don't currently go with lobbing McNukes at each other in order to defend exactly. to defend their clients. They, they, it makes if, them way less if, money. If they've been able to figure, if, if companies like that have been able to figure out in the current paradigm how to be able to work this out, and it's not necessarily just, it's not because of government that they do this. They actually, they've worked, you know, the insurance companies have worked together for years in this type of model where they, where they figure out, okay, yeah, because each company's uh, goal is to not pay out. That's kind of the point of an insurance company. <laughs> Every mm-hmm. insurance company sets out with the goal of being able to co- collect the, the most co- the most clients so they can collect the most amount of revenue and not have to pay out. <laughs> that's what, you know. That, yeah, that's the, that's the insurance model right there in a nutshell. So we need to put insurance on the blockchain. So yeah. they're, they're, incentiv- they're incentivized. They're, they're incentivized to find ways not to have to pay out. And so, so going to war for their clients not really cost effective. <laughs> yeah, that's actually like literally the least cost effective method for resolving a dispute that you could possibly choose. Exactly. I, there's no return on there there's like zero return on investment. Yeah. Unless you're actually, you know, so building did, the stuff too, but well the other thing Did you give your your ideas, Jeremy, on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I See a lot of a lot of this stuff, like you know, like Shane mentioned before, like it's you know some of these ideas. There are a lot of people's because you know they, they, we've we see this stuff in action now, Mike. My, because my, a lot of people uh, I I know their their response. Uh, one of the other main objections is usually, well, you know, what about the poor people, the people that can't afford these type of services? You know, I mean, you just course, want to kill old people. Well, of course, just admit it. You know, well, uh, but of course, well, hold that, on, that's squashed by uh, Viper Security or whatever that. Well, yeah, is. because Detroit, Detroit's the worst. It's the hellhole of America. America. Well, no one wants one, to be there. One and, of them. and this guy's yeah, it's one possible. of them. You're right. It's possible. <laughs> no, well, no, it is. It is possible to do even now and and show that show that they're yeah, examples. All but, I'm saying is, is that's not the richest place the in hundred, the world, hey, and they can Christ. afford let, it. So hey, let let Jeremy finish, dude. But the you know uh, and. You can see, you know, like I said, you can see some of this stuff working right now. So if it can work in the system already, where where it's already being hamstrung by the ridiculous laws and regulations, uh, then you can only imagine how much easier it would be to pull off when these regulations and those barriers to entry are out of the way. But you know, you, you talk about, you know, I think I was Andre maybe mentioned earlier about not having. Uh, you know, if you if you have more, it doesn't have to be geographical. You can have you know because you can have more than one in an area, and it doesn't necessarily have to be one particular company covers one like land. You know, one you know sectioned off area because it, it, it just it doesn't, start naming health or uh, health well, hold insurance companies hold, right now. Just hold on, hold on. So there's so you can go for hours. You don't. <laughs> thank you, Dave. So because you because you don't need to rely on having, you know, one per area and they could be spread out and they could cover multiple areas. But there's also, you know, in in more, say, rural areas where you have more people more spread out, you know, you may not even have the necessity for a full blown company and things like, you know, literally volunteer services kind of like you know you think of neighborhood watch where in certain areas they actually could be more effective than say a police force that is you know even a couple of miles away their closest location uh if the, if the members of said neighborhood watch were allow you know quote unquote allowed to be better protected if they weren't hamstrung by the laws that are in place you know there there may not even be a need in certain areas because the crime may be so low because everybody may, you know, they, they already may live yeah. by a set of <laughs> rules in that neighborhood that everybody already agrees to anyway, and everybody just kind of gets along, and you don't have to really deal with this crap. So yeah, we're we're not going to pay we're not going to pay for like this massive service. There may be a service close by that'd be like, hey, we'll cover you if you're needed. You pay us a smaller fee or something like that, and you know you can get away without paying. Plus. There's, you know, again, you're taking you're taking people being taxed out of the equation. So everybody naturally, ha- everybody now is wealthier because they're not being robbed 
to pay for this crappy service that they can't do anything about whether they make use of it or not. Uh, and so that ra- that de- that necessarily raises the wealth of everybody in the area, even the poorest person, and with, also without being taxed. And that also brings the opportunity for char- for private charities to make a large comeback, you know, as they were doing quite well before the government locked them out of the game in the first place. So, you know, there's so many different ways that these things could be taken care of. And be, be mentioning Detroit, like Dave did, it is a great example of the fact that it can be done now because Dale Brown started out by going, yeah, I know, I know not everybody is going to be able to pay for this, but he went to certain neighborhoods and went to certain apartment buildings and worked out deals with the, with the, with the, with the people who own the places. If they couldn't afford to pay him, like that's how he got his first, uh, I think he got his first office for his company. He just worked out a deal with it, with the landlord He's like, okay, you can't pay me. Give me a corner office and uh, you know, whatever, a five-year lease off the bat or like whatever it was or something like that. And uh, you know, you barter with people, man. So there's, there's like, always ways uh, around there, this there's stuff. There's been a there's been a certain a level of societal breakdown in certain parts of South Africa, and there has been a massive boom in private security there. Uh, so like, yeah, because farmers are literally s- being killed and dispossessed, like just well, straight up murdered. Here's the problem, right? Everyone says that well, when the state goes away, it would just be crazy and all this, but like you're seeing protection agencies pop up to protect people and property and they're actually working pretty well uh i mean this so it's it's getting bad over there i expect it to get even worse but just goes to show you that where there's a will there's a way that this market is going to be tried it can get worse what do you mean the u.s is going to intervene (laughs) <laughs> oh man, I don't I don't know what's see I, there was a big headline today that Australia prime minister is uh, weighing um free visas for everyone that's, you know, being uh told to get off their land right now in uh South Africa. I I that'll probably be what happens. You know, I I have a couple of friends that uh that uh married girls from south africa because like that's a big thing for girls there they get the hell out so well it's I, a crazy place over there well yeah, I, I can't imagine before before this the whole thing with the i mean obviously if we're burying the lead a little bit i mean what what is it the president i just can't imagine them letting that massive of a port city you know or asset you know go to shit that hard so something's gonna happen Do you know now. the history of south africa <laughs> well yeah they have, but no, also prob- know they have the no problem letting things go to shit over and over and over again no yeah, who's in charge the whites and the blacks or whatever back against a real military it's been, they but, can't but what is, but yeah for uh, i was trying to say before we bury the lead any further what, what's the story over there is the president made some decree that he wanted all white farmers to be vacant to be you know get the hell off their land or basically you know he said they're not calling for that yet but it was like a wink <laughs> yeah but, but i don't think they have everything in parliament to enact the legislation they want to confiscate all of it yet but like it's going to happen this year and they've they've made it they've made it abundantly clear that white farmers in south africa are not welcome there anymore and they should just leave now while they can yeah emphasis on well, while they can but there's a big thing that's been popping up. I mean, not to bury the lead even further of people not be their visa, uh, their passports, everything being restricted. They're not even allowed to leave uh, the airports and stuff after that. So, like, there's cr- crazy stuff happening. <laughs> well, I will see that. I, that actually ties back into what the one thing I was going to say, because I remember before this became big news, the one thing I, I, I heard about certain thing about protection agencies going on over there, but. Before, if someone like, lives in South Africa and wants to come on the show, you're more than welcome to come on. Uh, you can contact well, us I, on I, any I, yeah, I, social I, media platform. I'd always love to hear from anybody on the ground about this stuff. People willing to talk to us. But uh, I, I remember before this became... I, it's always way different. Than, I remember uh, before... Right. Hold on, Dave. I remember before this became really big news, the one thing I kept hearing that was actually becoming big in South Africa, which kind of ties into this whole you know security without the state thing, was cell 401 was actually becoming a big... was becoming heavily used over there. And oh. that's obviously we've, you know, we, we, I, we do free advertisement over here for self world one, one, one. I usually run the ads with pretty much all of our shows and we've talked yeah, about we've, I've had that app since it came out there. It's good stuff. Yeah. We've talked about that app before the uh, wonderful app that's uh, available for Android and iPhone, all that wonderful stuff uh, that there was this, with the design of trying to eliminate the need for the state because you can use it for emergencies. But people were using that over there because the government wasn't, you know, white and black because the government wasn't helping them at all. <laughs> with what you know what the what the problems they were having and 
before you know these private security companies that are now popping up started popping up people were like well, what the hell are we going to do so they started turning to each other which is kind of ties into the thing i was talking about with neighborhood watch and stuff like that like i i, I mean talk about what a vi you know your vision of you know and, and some people can you know you can call it utopian or whatever you want but you know realistically i i really think if you take away a lot of these restrictions that are now put in place to keep people from being able to bond together and protect themselves mm -hmm. without a, without a need because you know they they purposely the go governments purposely strip that ability from the citizenry to reinforce what they teach people is the quote unquote need for that monopolized policing. Well, you can't. Well, yeah, protect if you yourself. create a dependency and you're the only one that can fill it, bam! Suddenly you have a reason for existence. Exactly, you're cutting in on their market. <laughs> exactly. So you know the the less of these restrictions. I mean, we talked about this a little bit you know we talked about some of this last week about the efficacy of voting and stuff like that i mean and we all mentioned it's funny we actually got one comment on the show last week somebody who apparently was very mad at us because we 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 dared to say that we were accepting of no i don't think any of the three of us said that we would actually go out and vote again I, or anything like that. Yeah, I, I don't think any of us said that. I but said I, I'm because, not voting in anything higher than mayor. Because we, yeah, but because we, because we were quote unquote accepting of other people who were willing to engage in that. That meant we were as bad, if not worse, than the than the people that actually voted. Well, to Jeremy, use the, the I don't know if you know this. Us. Well, the purity <laughs> spiral not, is Jeremy, so real. I don't real. know if you know this. I don't know if you know this, but everything that that person doesn't like is not only exactly the same. But is literally evil. It's as evil <laughs> as evil can possibly be. Yes. And it's okay. statist. It's statist. There are no degrees. So. This is black and white. You're either a statist or you're free. Apparently. You're either free or you're a slave. Which is it, Jerry? Easy, Ben Schnittiger. Which mean, is uh, it? Andre. Oh. Which is it? Are you free or are you a slave? <laughs> Do you pay taxes? You're a slave. Taxes, one of those. Do you use roads? I mean, You're a slave. Yeah. Stop being a slave. Everybody's a slave. All right. We're all slaves. Anyway, but but my my. Before, before, and I quit before. Thank you before before I went and attacked one of our listeners because apparently they listen to the show enough to, to be able to make that response before before I went. Into well, that. they can more I, than they're more than welcome to come onto this show. No, and no, no we're not just this. inviting That's anybody. I, can I finish this thought, Dave? No, this is crazy. Okay, okay, let's back. Let's get yeah. back on topic. Yeah. Let's, so let's turn um, back around. So like I like I was saying, like I I, I think you know we're talking about my vision. I, I think you. Have have the ability to do these things if you can find some way to either you know whether you're going to engage in it or not if there's actually people active in the community who are trying to do things on the local level like is the one thing with like dave was talking about last week you know to try to affect change that way well if you are able to get certain regulations uh or, and laws repealed so that you have the ability to protect yourselves and not you know even if you are still forced in the present day to pay for the monopolized service if they're not living up to your standards and you can find a way to make things happen you know whether it is forming you know forming a private security company or just you know using cell 411 amongst a group of friends or neighbors or whatever it is stuff like this you could start doing this right now or like we talked about with stuff like uh, threat management up in Detroit and and yeah. he's, it's actually expanded to a couple other places I can't remember where but I know that it, other they've been trying this in other areas too um, or you could see we've he's talked, talked about state fran he's talked about state franchising if I recall correctly he 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 has, but I think they actually have set up in other areas. I just can't remember where, but they have uh, what should we call it? Or there's, you know, you talk, we've talked about on the show before too. Where there's places around the country that actually have fired their entire police force because they found them so either so corrupt and, and or unnecessary that they just got rid of them. And things actually haven't been that bad because they've, you know, either private uh, firms have started to move in, uh, or the people are taking better care of themselves. So the more this can happen, this is how. These, this is how these ideas spread, which ties into the thing we were talking about last week too, about the whole leading by example thing. You know, you just have to show because that's how you create that market demand. That's how you show people. Oh, oh shit! Wait a minute. It's, it's I don't have to depend on this the police do. department that has like a horrible response time and 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 as far as solving actual crimes go, like their 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 uh, you know their uh, conviction rates are atrocious and stuff like this, as as we've talked about before on the national average. You know, you got to get out there and show people that it can be done. So it's because they can't price anything correctly, that's the biggest problem with police, and most people don't understand it at that fundamental of a level. Is that with when you have a socialized service, you are going to run into what Mises has called the economic 
uh, price calculation problem. And it's when you're working off stolen funds, since you aren't having to price you know, your capital here, you're just working off stolen funds, you don't know how to actually price your service or do them correctly because you're not knowing your real demand because you're only surviving off of theft. So it's really just, we can do as much as we can steal. That's, that's essentially the state's model. Hey, Shane, I had a, a question for you because we were talking about, uh, we started talking about with uh, um, multiple different sources of uh, security, private security. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Jeremy mentioned this in particular, and it's something I've kind of thought about some uh, quite a bit recently here. Um, what do you, uh, would you consider that the, like a, a neighborhood watch type thing um, would be cropping up more and more absent state intervention? Because I, I mean, we, we've talked about, you know, private security firms as businesses. Oh, yeah. Um, but I seem to think, I think at least that uh, like smaller communities, like subdivisions, for example, I mean, maybe some of the ritzier ones would have a formal uh, security firm, but I think a lot of places would actually go back to having, you know, the hue and cry, the neighborhood watch. Yes. I do think you're more likely to see stuff like that. And um, even the more we use apps like Cell 411, the better they become and the less reliable, the less we rely on, you know, say monopolized services or even other firms, you know, it becomes more and more localized at that point. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that. A cell 411 is a great stepping stone. And I think that's kind of like the first the first step in that direction to a, a much more decentralized provision of uh, of security. But yeah, I think I mean, the neighborhood I used to live in and the neighborhood I live in now, honestly, I mean, I absent a police force, I would see most of, you know, most of us, many of us that are capable of doing it, uh, providing physical security, you know, doing, doing patrols through like walking down the street and just, you know, keeping an eye out. Mm -hmm. I certainly, I I certainly wouldn't mind. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I don't because I'm probably going to get, you know, the cops probably going to pull me over and wonder what the fuck I'm doing. Another big thing is, (laughs) is when the state takes over something, they, everyone thinks that that thing's being handled. And like I just said earlier, they can't price anything. They're not really doing it correctly. So they're not handling it correctly. That's why the EPA doesn't really protect the the environment. That's why the FCC doesn't really regulate the sound waves. They just stop who they don't want saying stuff on it. You know, it's all a sham Whoa. to get you to think, oh, this is being handled, but it's really not yeah. at all. Yeah, but I, I think at the, at the very least, that when it comes to pol- the aspect of policing, I do think more and more people that that's one thing. I mean, we've we've gone back and forth on this before, as far as you know the what the current position of the overall you know American citizenry is currently. You know how apathetic they are to to government and whatnot, and whether they actually want things to change or whether they've given up. But I really do think that there there has been a shift over the past you know couple of decades, you know the the last decade really, uh, in particular, where I think a lot more people have been have become a lot more critical despite the you know the the backing like the thin blue line and all these different websites and all this stuff and different stuff seem to get i really do think there has been a, a shift in the overall view of policing and there's a lot more people that are are recognizing that they are not being provided the service that they think they're being that they're paying for now grant and again most of these people would prob are pro- probably saying they willingly pay for these these type of things because they don't view taxation the same way that and they're we just do. not doing what we want I, yeah I've heard but i, I think a lot times. more people are coming to that realization that wait a minute wait a minute this is you know whether whether they're they're hardcore about understanding how bad the police brutality is, or whether just like they're starting to go, wait a minute, you know, I still kind of believe that bad apple theory, but there really seems to be a hell of a lot more of these bad apples around, you know, is, or is it just me? Like, you know, wet, no matter where they are on that spectrum, I, I think there are a lot more people like that. So that's why I believe right, you know, right now is an excellent time to be showing people these different options, which is why I, I love the fact that, you know, people like Dale Brown uh, exist and are getting the opportunity to do. And that's why I, I also love to give as much attention as I can to stuff like that. And I would like to see more of it. And I think uh, a lot, if we, you know, if you there's know, a lot of retired and, and ex military that are unemployed right now that I'm sure a working business model could easily be found. 
Yeah. Easily. You just have to, again, in, in the current paradigm, you just have to be wary of where you're located and try, if you're going to try to do it, then you have to try to figure out ways to work around the, the laws that you're going to have to deal with in the interim until you can convince enough people, Hey, we don't need this other system anymore. And people can kind of, you know, at this state can slowly disintegrate as so many of us hope that it well through like whether it's a session or whatever it is that enough people start breaking off and going i don't want to play this game anymore let's try this over here type of thing you know so the more this can happen and that's exactly what dale brown did he worked around the exist because he's been in they've actually been in business for like even before dis 12? detroit no 20 he, i think years? he's been over it's been over 20 years at this point oh okay because he started bef like detroit was already crumbling at that point but most of america hadn't realized it yet it wasn't until it became big news that all of a sudden it was like oh my god detroit it's like detroit's actually been on its way down for a long time people you just haven't been paying attention but he set up a while back and he just he worked with the laws he had and that's and because of that he was able to design his system around nonviolence, like their whole their whole objective is to try to get things accomplished without having to use force like the police would, you know, and he, he was kind of forced to create that model because of the restrictions that were put on him. But now that's something that can be duplicated and put out and it, whether it you know it, it whether it has to be tweaked a little bit because of the different you know a different state and a different set of laws or whatever but there's already a model that's been designed to work around the system anyway you know so if that's possible now you can, it's it's impossible to not imagine how many more models and how how much better it could get the less restrictions there are you know, unless you're a crazy person. I don't know. That's just my thought. That uh, that makes me think of a funny story uh, involving uh, involving Detroit threat management or uh, whatever it's called now. But I, I read it. I read it on his website. Either that or it was in an interview. But uh, there was one time where he was dealing with a, a bunch of uh, drug dealers or just like general shifty, shifty types, you know, the violent types, the gangbangers on a street corner. And he arranged to have one of his employees go down there and start hanging out with him. And then one day, just out of the blue, him and a couple of the other guys used their company van and like drew, like screeched around the corner, grabbed this dude, threw him in an arm bar and like jammed him in the van and like peeled off. Right. And uh, needless to say, that corner was clear from pretty much then on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They they basically it's, they, it's they arrested creative. a decoy. It's creative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's creative. Oh, it's creative. Cre yeah, and since, and since they band. weren't and since they weren't the cops, since they weren't the cops, those gang members were like, "Well, these aren't the police, so well, I don't even know what the fuck these guys are going to do. Like, I have no idea what the fuck these people will do. At least cops are like a a known quantity. I know kind of how to deal with them. Like this shit's fucking yeah. black vans and people getting thrown into vans and shit. I don't even know." <laughs> so they uh they they left and they did not come back. Yeah, and in van. I, I remember. I actually I remember hearing him tell that story. On I was I, he definitely told it on a podcast one because I remember hearing him tell that one. That is a great story because again, look what he had to do. He didn't have to use any violence. I mean, they they fake roughed up one of their own people to make it look like it, and that's all it took. And yeah, it was like it, it was a great success because you know you put that uncertainty in people. The same reason as we've talked previously before. The whole reason when, when people think you know you have to take away guns to make people. Say Safer, no, and you don't, and and but you don't also necessarily have to arm everybody either. You just have to put the thought in the quote unquote bad people's mind that the other person could be armed, that the other person could be more of a threat to make them th hesitate just a little bit, to make them reconsider yep. just a little bit. You know, it, it, just like ev everything in life is a threat assessment. Everything in life is is a risk, is a balancing of risk and reward, like. What are the risks, and what am I going to get out of this? Nah, -uh, daddy government's going to take care of me, John Andre. No well, risks. Yeah, I know, and that's and that's Zero. the problem, and that's Zero the problem. Risks. That's the problem. Well, you know, and unfortunately, yeah, that is something. Well, we part have, of the problem, but well, yeah, it's a big part of the problem. Because unfortunately, yeah. it's something we have to overcome. Because as as I was saying, I think a lot of people are starting to look at the police and going, "Hey, wait a minute, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to do." And especially, unfortunately, it's intertwined with the crap that we're dealing with right now, with like the stupid national walkout day, which was just such an atrocity. Uh, the fact that they, <laughs> the fact that they can keep claiming that so these many kid, memes, these kids were doing, these kids were standing up for themselves. It's like no, like because. 
I actually heard we have, you know, our friend of the show, Paul Gordon, played for us a voicemail that he received at his home uh, from his daughter's school saying, letting people know that claiming that this was student led, but admitting in the message that this was organized by the women, you know, the whatever, the national women, you know, whatever Ugh. it was like. And so it's like you're, you're totally admitting that you're organizing this stuff and kind of putting this kids up to it. And there's been notes coming home from different schools all across the country, you know, basically from kids and stuff saying, wait a minute, this is not what I was told. We were told we were just supposed to go stand outside just to honor to these kids. We weren't told it had anything to do with guns or anything like that. We were supposed to be standing up for banning guns. <laughs> like they told us this as we were walking out the doors that day. So um, we do have to overcome that type of stuff because it's real shysty shit for real. People are. It is. It the, is. Yeah, I know, but the, the point of that was people are people are people are distrusting the police, but they're still turning to government. And they don't realize that when they ask the government to enforce more laws, who when in that moment they're not thinking, well, who's going to enforce those laws? Well, the same police you're mad at. That doesn't fix the. It, problem. it was like you I said what, no? what, yesterday, Jeremy. I said, uh, "Trump's a fascist. Who do we want to ban guns? Tr tr Trump." <laughs> it's like, wait a second. Uh, you know do what? I don't know. Moron. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know because I think they're they're starting to become this innate sense that uh, because you can't you can only ignore cognitive dissonance for so long before it becomes so uncomfortable that you just can't ignore it anymore. And some people, of course, are better at this than others. You know, I look. I at don't Kyle know. Wagner. I think some people have uh, no. Zero. Well, okay. well, yeah. Like for example, somebody like Kyle Wagner. Uh, you look <laughs> at him, and that man doesn't even know what cognitive dissonance <laughs> is. He wouldn't know cognitive dissonance if it struck him in the face with a two by four. <laughs> but. Uh, Jeez. You know, the average person, cognitive dissonance is extremely discomforting. And there's only so much you can do to kind of get away from that, especially when it's rooted in actions you're taking. If your own actions are causing you cognitive dissonance, it's really, really hard to ignore that. I mean, you can try and so most of the time you can get away with it, uh, but you can only do it for so long before it just kind of builds and starts to really make you question what the hell is going on and what you're doing as a part of it or like what your motivations are. So I don't know. I, I I I think it's it's steadily improving. I think we're we're moving you know, more rapidly in that direction where we're not going to be relying on government for these solutions. And I think a lot of it is just this, you know, lashing out out of this place of extreme discomfort because you know a lot of people are seeing firsthand that the very policies they're trying to institute are not functional. Well, I and think so of course their first reaction, well I mean, their first reaction, yeah, and uh, their first like reaction, of course, is like freaking out and saying no we need more but in the back of their minds they're like well we had more and it didn't do anything so what are we going to do and if, yeah like you were saying technology i think is going to go a long way to uh, facilitating that ultimately i think this wasn't going to get us to a stateless society is the level of our technological advancement and the level of our technology has has made it much much easier to accomplish these tasks that were like unheard of you know even 10 15 years ago like cell 411 that was a uh, a pipe dream that was you know a, a theoretical exercise 15 years ago and now i mean it doesn't even require that much programming and effort to make a program similar to it nope there needs to be cell 411 with a crypto overlay and then it's basically just over not everything um, has to be crypto dave yes it does <laughs> <laughs> cell 411 on the blockchain blockchain all the things so everything Shane, is blockchain we're all blockchain Shane, now what um what's been going on you've been working on anything new uh recently anything like projects or anything well um i just recently have freed up some time to start focusing on other things but i'm not sure which direction i want to run with it uh, i'm looking into maybe starting a podcast but i have to get a little bit of uh, technical expertise when it comes to certain programs first before i feel comfortable enough to actually do that on my own um uh, but, what what do you uh, what's, wanna, what's like what's what's in your gut to talk about like what what do you what are you feeling like you need to be talking about on there? Well, um, some of the things that I'm more knowledgeable in, and some of the things like the that I came to from before I discovered you know anarchy or libertarian philosophy was uh, things like you know conspiracy theories and uh, also entheogens like uh, pharmaceuticals Ooh. and things like that or um, something I've been into for a long time and I know a lot about and those are the things I can talk freely about you know and fill up a whole podcast with and uh, i feel like you know i'm not gonna stray away from anarchy but i'm gonna try to incorporate those kind of topics within you know just the anarchist you know mindset 
Um, but I do want to revisit something earlier you said about, you know, Detroit being a hellhole. And I do visit there occasionally. And it's not really as bad as people think. Um, or if not, it's actually getting better. And I don't, I'm not going to attribute this to the state or maybe even attribute it to the private security that, that operates there. But um, the, the city is actually building up and getting better. Um, and I'm really not sure what factors are contributing to that. But you know, uh, my most recent uh, visit to Detroit has pretty much convinced me that they've turned around and are starting to head in the right direction. Wow. All, I've, all, I'll, I've got a few friends that live there that, you know, jokingly always bash it, but I, I don't know truly how bad it is uh, there. You know, all you can hear is the stories unless you've seen it or been there or know someone that's that been there. So I, I have, it's, I, it, I know it's probably not as bad as Baltimore, but I, I've heard Baltimore is very bad. That makes me sad when I hear how bad Baltimore. I still love that city, but yeah, no, I, I've heard similar things about Detroit that it has been. Aside from the the whole threat management thing, that there actually was, uh, there was a couple of stories about it. Gosh, maybe even three or more years now ago that I was reading about how people were actually starting to build the city back up outside of the government because you know the government still basically is bankrupt it has, it has no it has nothing they're just waiting to, for people to build it up so they can leech again well yeah Fuck. unfortunately if if people don't wise up to the mistakes that were made by government in the first place yeah that is what that can be the inevitable result we see it you know you see it all the time but that was what was building the starting to build the community back up was the community itself the people that didn't run the people that stuck that either stuck it out whether out of necessity or just a stubbornness that they were just just like ah, everybody else can flee we'll stick here and you know rebuild type of attitude because you know for how long was detroit one of the centers of industry and in, if not the center of industry in the country with the oh, car the manufacturing and center stuff? of the automobile world well exactly literally so like you know there is still that spirit there in 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 certain people that stuck around and they were the ones who started rebuilding and that to me i i i love i love stories like that because once again that's like a a real world real-time example for people of voluntarism and and you know the dreaded a word anarchy in action Ooh. <gasps> that Man, that okay. we can point to when people say this stuff can't work. What are you talking about? You're watching it happen in real time. They're not doing it because of government. They're not doing it with government. They're literally doing it in spite of the government exactly. in that air, in Detroit. Yeah. Like literally doing it in spite of the government, and look what could be accomplished. And you, you know, you were talking about, you know, I think you were talking. We had been talking about this earlier, Dave. Uh, some other ideas we were talking about, you know, and you were talking about having ideas but not having the capital. It's like, look what could be accomplished. These people had no fucking capital, <laughs> and look what they're able to pull off. There, it, it really is amazing what the human spirit is is capable of when pushed to the when pushed to certain limits. So, you know, for people who say that these ideas that we, that people like us have and put out there, oh, you know, you can't possibly survive without a, without the monopolized police force. You can't possibly survive without a monopolized military, monopolize this, monopolize that, yada, yada, yada. You can't possibly, bullshit. Look at it going on right now. And, tell, and now try to tell me with a straight face that this shit can't be done with more people involved and more people putting in effort. <laughs> like, it, it, uh, no, 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 no. Amazonian tribes and aboriginal tribes just completely shit on the idea that you have to have a state completely. <laughs> they're still here. They're still alive. They may not be as advanced as everybody, but they're not killing each other, right? They're still Amazonian tribes that haven't been touched for six, seven hundred years. Yeah, so, give, give it time. They're going to wipe everybody out pretty soon enough with destroying the well, rainforest down there. <laughs> well, yeah, Brazil's getting crazy, but uh, I, I, I just think it it's silly this idea that we have to have this entity forcing a monopoly. Like why? Like I, I don't understand it, and it's so inefficient. And you know, just everything can be reduced to every problem in policing right now can be reduced to the economic calculation problem after you remove all the emotions and you remove all of the bad actors and everything else when you look at all of the core problems with policing it is it cannot price itself correctly that's it and we have to find a solution or we're just going to well, sit here continually 
Un- unfortunately, part of the you solution know, to that, Dave, is first you have to teach pre- people about the economic calculation problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> because most That's, people don't I understand do that, that term. most of my day. <laughs> uh, anyway. But I, before but yeah, I will you're say right. that after having lived in the Midwest most of my life and uh, spent a number of years where, you know, I visit cities like Detroit and Chicago quite, you know, regularly. I will say that Detroit seems to be getting better, but Chicago seems to be getting worse. And I, if I had the choice to visit one or the other, I would much rather visit Detroit than Chicago, especially, you know, lately. Well, and that, well, that's good to yeah, know. Chicago's nuts. Well, see, and that's, but that's interesting though, Shane, especially because you said before, you know, you can't, you, you weren't willing, you know, you, you weren't sure what was actually causing the, you know, the, the improvements going there. You couldn't say one way or the other, but again, this is, you know, it's correlation. It's, I'm not saying this is causation, but you know, that's a great example. Look at, look at those two cities. And if you're saying just at least from your anecdotal perspective that Detroit is, you're, you'd rather go there, which a lot more people think is worse just because what right. they're told or whatever, where the the government has all but completely failed the people, you know, <laughs> where in Chicago, the government I and mean, the government is failing the people in Chicago, but they're still trying to clamp down and they haven't reached the bankruptcy point. They should have, but they haven't yet of what we you know. They haven't reached the level that the Detroit raised. So the fact that Chicago is their hardest. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. But the fact that it keeps going downward, despite. Bite. Isn't Illinois completely bankrupt? Like this, the whole state? I don't. I, I've seen numbers about that. I don't remember if it Aren't was the they entire like the state. First real big bank. I could be. I, I think I could. I, I could have remembered that all of their state pension, right? So like all the people that have state worker pensions there, that all went defunct like 2016 or or 15, so, and they've been like borrowing money to pay back IOUs on these pensions, even. Like they're that broke. That that sounds about right, but that's that's that goes right to my point. They're they're floundering, but they're still holding on, and they're still trying to to, to impose their control. And it's look like how a much drunk things- bitch at the bar. Somebody needs to cut them off. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because look how mu- <laughs> look how much worse it keeps getting. You know, ugh. Pretty for pretty pretty sure the pants are going to be down on the ankle. She's going to be bent over a, to- <laughs> a toilet seat. You know, and uh, oh boy. Anyway, Illinois. while while, while <laughs> puking, that note, while puking. On that note, I think we should probably start getting wrapping up. But first, Shane, do you have anything else you want to say before we get going? Because we always we always tend to invite you on and then talk a lot, and you don't get to say as much as I think you should be saying, considering you're our guest. Well, that's fine. I mean, I do like the four person format. You know, it's kind of like a free for all where you got to jump in every now and then. But, um, you know, hey, I'm just glad to be here. Um, Seeds of Liberty was probably the one of the first podcasts I started listening to um, back when Danilo was on. And uh, you guys have, you know, kind of been a big influence on me over the years. And I'm glad you're still here. And I'm glad to be a part of it. So, yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, well, it's our I pleasure appreciate you agreeing here. to come on, Sh- uh, Sean. Man, <laughs> brain fart. Sean. Shane. Sean. <laughs> Sorry. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, sh- Jesus uh, Christ, Dave, just stop talking. Shane, right. thank you so much for coming on. I'm freaking having a massive brain heart fart. <laughs> Dave's not the one who's high. That's the funny thing. Anyway. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> oh, I haven't I ate that, all day. I guess that's close enough. All right. Well, yeah. So, but yeah. Well, Shane, I did eat you're, earlier. You're, 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 always, you're always welcome here, man. So uh, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you came on too. And this conversation uh, actually turned out a lot differently than I first thought it would. And Dave posed the posed it earlier as a, as a suggestion, and I was like, "Where are we really going to go with this that, that we haven't covered before?" But I think we I think we managed to take it to some new places. So I I, I like that I like that we did this. So thank you thank you for coming on, um, Andre. Uh, anything else before we go, Dave? Uh, no, I just I'm I'm glad I'm glad we were on, and I'm actually really happy that we had this conversation. It's something that I think uh, uh, we kind of tend to gloss over because we kind of focus on other things a little bit more but uh it's one of those foundational fundamental things that we really do need to to hammer the point home on and i think it's one of the easier things to really convince people of despite the fact that it doesn't seem that way at first so i I always appreciate the chance to to discuss this uh discuss this with uh with people that I, i i trust and i feel can add to the conversation which is all of you guys here Woohoo. All right. I wouldn't trust me, but I uh, <laughs> I second that. I trust you. No, th- th- thanks for coming on, uh, Shane. For real, I'm sorry I botched your name five thousand times earlier. Uh, and Jeremy and Andre, great show, boys. Uh, as always, uh, fuck communists.
All right. Amen. Well, and on that note, yes, on that note, well, uh, th- thank you, everybody. Once again, this has been great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, all of our content can be found at solpodcast.org. And the Patreon still going. I did manage to get that second episode in last week. and uh, Actually, I got to put another one out tomorrow, but we're still on track. Plenty of things. Thank you once again for all of our fine patrons who continue to donate. And we are getting closer to our goal now, thanks to uh, the additions from, uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, Lane Raper, who is our latest, pa- uh, newest patron. Yay! Uh, we're getting ever closer to our, our next goal. If we do reach that $100, Thank you guys. we will start uh, going to two shows a week on Patreon. And, you know... Dave, Dave keeps promising to give me content. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you everybody who donates there. And if you don't, if you don't already, please go consider checking us out and uh, throwing a buck at us. And uh, you can get all the content that we have there on Patreon. So once again, thank you everybody for listening, and we will catch you next time. Peace. Peace in the Sudan. Peace in. Myanmar because oh, man. It, Yemen, mean, 80% like, last Buddhist. week Yemen Yemen needs peace now well, Myanmar is what like 80% yeah. Buddhists oh mean, Yemen's so like 2008 bro deal with the times you don't want to go to Yemen <laughs> no you don't This is Daryl W. Perry, host of Free Talk Live. This November, I'll be running in the world's biggest and most popular marathon, the New York City Marathon, and I've accepted a spot on Team Innocence Project because I'm a passionate supporter of their work. Since 1989, 353 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 38 who pled guilty to crimes they did not commit and 20 of whom served time on death row. The Innocence Project provided direct representation or critical assistance in 180 of these cases. With your help, the Innocence Project can help even more people who have been wrongly convicted. As part of Team Innocence Project, I am raising awareness about wrongful convictions and raising funds to help free the innocent. I've already paid the race registration fees. However, to secure my spot on Team Innocence Project in the New York City Marathon, I need to raise $3,500 by November 1st. You can support the Innocence Project and help me secure my race entry by going to run.freetalklive.com.